everyone. Welcome to The Racer Decides. This is episode 12 of this very occasional broadcast. Uh, this is, of course, for the 2024 Tasmanian state election, which some of you might even be saying, I didn't even know there was an election going on. So, uh, yeah, there is. I didn't know that Tasmania right. existed. <laughs> That's right. Uh, I don't know if you remember, I don't know if they still do this, but on the tip top bread, the their logo was like a map of Australia without Tasmania. Tasmania. Was that? that happens a lot. <laughs> Yeah, it does. People forget about you, but we haven't. We're doing an episode all about you today. So um, just before in. we get into it, uh, I just wanted to say uh, I'm sure a lot of people noticed there's not been much output from the racer uh, in the past couple of weeks. We apologize. Yeah, I was at a methadone that. clinic. <laughs> yeah, we've been all sorts of withdrawal symptoms have been, uh, have been noted. Um, no, I've actually just um, moved house. So, yeah. Um, anyone who's done that before, I think pretty much all of us have. We know how much of an absolute bitch that is to do, and it runs in conflict with all the other commitments that you've got. I think snowball and yeah, let's just say the racer is not the only thing that I have uh, fallen behind with. And um, yeah, like our Telegram and our post channels have been pretty inactive. Again, sorry for that. We'll really try uh, to. Your, your attendance at the gooning sessions has been somewhat lacking over these past couple of weeks. Yeah, and I haven't had, like, uh, Glort is offline now, so he doesn't get on my back about that stuff anymore. So maybe that's why. I don't know. <laughs> I haven't had the same... What, you need a little friend. monkey to whip you? I can do that. I got a whip I'm right not, here. Look, either that or I've just got to reach out to more of the Perth boys to kind of help me with uh, ru running everyday administrative stuff. But, yeah. Yeah, a lot of them so are look, coming out of the weeds, making new connections over here, getting back old ones. Yeah. Uh, we, yeah, we're kind of um, gradually building connections, which is good. I hope that is happening wherever our listeners are as well. Uh, but look, in terms of a new uh, racist war, that will be probably we'll record it on Tuesday and then we'll give you another one the Thursday after Easter. So, and then after that, hopefully, hopefully we go back to just doing it every week again, much more regular, consistent output so, back on the snowy road yeah please don't hold me to any of that but that's the plan anyway for the time being um okay so look uh this is uh of course a race of sides episode we're not doing a live one we're just doing a kind of uh, post-election wrap-up which is the way we usually did the race of sides until we started uh doing the, the live shows on Streamyard. but this we is should, just we should do a live show we should do a live show at some point if you okay. can I want. I do want to start doing live shows again because I do miss doing um, X Y Z live. That was always a lot of fun. You miss the chaos. I, I do. I love being able to like. I didn't have to watch my language. I had a soundboard. Uh, we got to speak to new people every week, and there were no rules as well. Everything we do, like on uh, the Roses War, is all very prepped, and you know, we're always organized, just distinct. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I would love to go back to doing that. Um, I'm just, uh, I've got a project I've been working on myself. And uh, I think what we'll do is when we do get the live show going again, I will announce what that project is. And yeah, it's right. um, I think something that's actually been in the works for a few years now. So I, uh, and it's like, it's like most things in my life, it's run over time. So we're, we're, we're launching, launching a new, uh, a new, a new media platform, a new show, the Bug Chasers War and everything. Well, okay. People can speculate <laughs> as to what exactly it is, but it's actually something fairly independent of the racer, let's say. Yeah. It's really just something that I've been doing. Um, but yeah, I'll let you, I'll let everyone know. Okay. Now, how about we go get now into and get into what we were supposed to be doing today, which of course is covering the state election. So uh, we were not supposed to have this election until next year. So uh, this was called early by um, the Liberal Premier Jeremy Rockcliffe. Uh, the reason being because, well, uh, they haven't exactly been plagued by scandal. Uh, let's say that they have been plagued by instability. Uh, people constantly wondering if the government would uh 
fail in its legitimacy because, remember, they were already in minority government because you had two uh, liberal MPs who became independents, uh, both of whom uh, resigned from the party because of the, the AFL stadium. So, I mean, going through the prep for today, and I admit I'm under prepped, but uh, the usual stuff, of course, comes up, cost of living, education, health, all of that. Uh, yeah. But real sort of uh, anomaly in the Tasmania election has to be this AFL stadium. So, yeah, the two Liberal MPs in question resigned. They became independents. And at various points uh, during um, the last uh, tenure of the Liberal government, um, they were threatening to um, withdraw their support. So even though they were independents, they were still guaranteeing um, the passage of certain bills in the lower house, uh, effectively meaning the Liberal Party stay in power, albeit as a minority government. Now, um, looking at the results anyway, uh, that is going to continue. So if there's kind of one irony about what's going on here, because of that lack of stability in the Liberal government in Tasmania, uh, this, this election was supposed to actually solve that issue. Uh, arguably, it's actually made it worse. Uh, in terms of the count here. So let me just quickly go to the ABC News website. I'm going to F5 this. So here's our current house for the, oh, sorry, our current count for the lower house, I should say. Um, the Liberals do have the most seats on 13. The AOP have 10. The Greens have four. Uh, the Jackie Lambie party has two. Um, they come up here as independent on the uh, on the ABC News website. I'm not sure why, because they are actually a minor party. So the Jackie Lambie Network obviously started by former Palmer United Senator Jackie Lambie, who is a born and bred Tasmanian, and who I guess have surprised a lot of people in terms of just how electorally successful they've been at both the um, state and federal level. So... So, yeah, that is the outcome here. Um, you have to get um, uh, 18 seats to form a majority in the Tasmanian parliament uh, because there are 35 seats altogether. And by the way, that's 10 more seats uh, in comparison to the last election. And that was another little kind of strange tidbit of this election was there was an extra 10 electorates added. So, yeah, all a little strange. Um, the oddball um, state where everyone sort of looks like each other and maybe goes a second head. Um, you're so fucking... Is a bit weird. No offence to any Tasmanians out there. Um, uh, no, um, I, 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 you could probably say that's just because of the, the level of, like, instability that came over the basically shit canning of that stadium. Well, it's not exactly a shit canning. I mean, we've got uh, material on this, but uh, okay. if, if, if well, I'll just give people a quick ba uh, background on this. Uh, there are, of course, plans to introduce uh, an AFL team in Tasmania, and we know who they are now. They're the Tasmanian Devils. They actually released the um, like the colours and the jersey and everything the other day. Um, what what surprised me, and you know, I know nothing about AFL, so. Um, this is probably why it surprised me. They said that uh, the team will not become active, will not play in the AFL until 2028, so another four years, which I don't know. I, I have no idea about the business and the logistics and everything behind it, but it's actually a, a whole four years before you enter the competition, even though you've got the name and, and everything. Like, I don't know. That just seems bizarre to me. But, but anyway... Um, like the real weird thing and the very controversial thing about this is that the AFL basically said to the Tasmanian government, uh, if you want to be um, a competitive force in the AFL, uh, you've got to build a new stadium there because the one you've got at the moment is shit. I don't even really know that uh, if that's true. Um, plenty of critics of the proposed stadium have been saying that Tasmania is more than well equipped um, for 
uh, AFL because they have actually held AFL matches. They do every year. Um, I believe uh, Hawthorne is actually the team of choice for people in uh, Tasmania. Um, I didn't say that because I knew a guy from Tasmania. He went for Hawthorne and he said, yeah, most people go for Hawthorne. So, uh, well, now we'll have a new new favourite, hopefully, unless it just gets socially shunned into non-existence. Well, and look, again, I could be totally wrong on that. It's anecdotal. I don't follow the AFL, so, you know, I don't I don't really know about this stuff. But But anyway, that was the controversial thing. The AFL said you have to build a stadium, and that means, of course, that it comes at the taxpayer expense. So the Liberal government set aside $375 million for the construction of the, of the stadium, which would be right out uh, by the ocean side. It was a pretty nice, um, nice little location. And critics naturally... Not offense to Tasmania, there's not too many bad little locations over there. Very beautiful place. It is, yeah. Like, um, to, to pull back the jokes about you having two heads and everything, I can just actually having a, a look through the prep, having a, a look at the landscape. Everything is very picturesque in, in Tasmania. It really is. And I've never been there. I would love to go. Don't, don't worry. We'll, we'll sort that out soon. Why, why is that? Just look at the fucking housing housing promises. Oh, we'll right. get to it. But holy we'll fucking shit. We'll get <laughs> but look... Um, people said, like, why is it that when, you know, we've got a cost of living crisis, we've got obviously a housing crisis, we've got, uh, like every other state, there's an issue with ambulance ramping in Tasmania. Why are we dedicating almost half, an, half a billion dollars to the construction of an AFL stadium when, I mean, the AFL could probably just fund it themselves, given they are a multi-billion dollar industry. Uh, you know, it was a, a bit cheeky of them to basically just pass off the costs onto the Tasmanian taxpayer. And that message resonated with a lot of voters. A lot of people are very angry about that. Um, even the Greens, for example, um, were saying that they fully support um, the Tasmanian devils coming into the AFL, but at the same time, they don't support a new stadium. They say the current facilities are more than adequate. So, so yeah. Don't know. Maybe you've got a different view. Um, anyway. No. Uh, yeah, look, I can't believe I'm agreeing with, with the Greens, but, yeah, I'd say that's probably probably true. And I'm always sceptical when you've got, like, you know, big businesses and big corporations. And let's say, so the AFL is basically just one big corporation um, just trying to uh, cut cut costs um, by just handballing it, forgive the uh, the AFL pun, but uh, over to the, the government and just saying, all right, well, the, well, the, uh, the taxpayer's got to foot the bill here. I think that is that is real dirty. It's uh, dirty crony capitalism. Um, yeah. Anyway. We see a whole so bunch, though. We've got uh, roughly 400,000 registered voters, enrolled voters in Tasmania, and roughly 100,000 of them uh, voted before Saturday. So I guess this is part of the, uh, the new normal COVID world where people like getting in ahead and doing things early and doing things online so they can avoid the queues and all that kind of thing. Um, and like uh, kind of following in the trend of the last federal election, uh, Independents and minor parties were widely predicted to have their primary vote increase, and we have seen that as well. So the the, uh, the primary vote for both Liberal and Labor was around about sixty percent uh, in terms of like every uh, vote that ended up being counted towards them. It was about sixty percent came from primary votes, with the forty percent coming from everything else coming from preferential votes. So, you know, someone voting green, uh, but then preferencing Labor, and then their vote follows at full value to Labor when the green candidate is not elected. That's the way our preferential really? voting system works. Uh, but, yeah, um, increasingly we are finding that the major parties are coming into power on the back of preferences, not on the back of 
primary votes, which is absolutely a sign that people are switching over to minor parties and independents. They're becoming disillusioned with the two-party system and with the ability of the major parties to actually govern effectively. So, yeah, um, a lot of commentators have been saying that this is simply um, just following that trend again and that this trend will continue all the way up until the next federal election. And I, I don't doubt that uh, at all. Um, all right. So we want to get into some of the issues here. Now, uh, the ABC actually identified uh, five main issues for this election. Uh, I'll give you four of them. Um, they were education. Uh, oops, let me just scroll back up here. Uh, education, health, housing, and the economy and cost of living. Now, these are very bread and butter issues that are issues at every election. So yeah, no fucking, there. also, they're currently like hot and heavy and spanning the entire goddamn fucking country right now. Yes. Uh, but then your fifth election, uh, fifth issue, like I said, was actually the AFL stadium. Uh, uh, yeah, like just the, this was really the, the strange one in the mix that did activate a lot in the electorate. Um, in other words, when they sought feedback from the public, they would very often name this issue as important, which, yeah, a little strange. Anyway, let's kind of go through what we've got here. Uh, we'll start with health. Um, as I said, uh, ambulance ramping was um, an issue here. Uh, short of staff, short shortages of um, nurses, of uh, nurses, doctors, other medical professionals, particularly at hospitals. Um, so the Libs supported um, $9 million uh, for, a, what is this, a $9 million four-bed mother and baby centre at the Launceston Health Club, $4 million to continue the mother-baby unit at Royal Hobart Hospital, uh, yep. $82.5 million for a 40-bed uh, older person's mental health complex to be built at St. John's Park in Newtown. Now, I always notice that uh, the mental health commitments in every consecutive election go up. And you notice like the, the last two issues I mentioned just then, one would cost $9 million, the other cost $4 million. Yeah, this one is costing $82.5 million. <laughs> so I wonder why that is. Is that following some kind of trend that they actually have supplied to them by the Information given yeah. to them by the Australian and statistics. Not, and by the Have way, I'm just going collectively I'm fucking mad. This is not a dig at Tasmania either, because as I said, it happens in every election, every state. It's a dig at every state. It's a, I'm dig, having a dig at the whole country in terms of our deteriorating uh, mental state. Um, but again, it's like this is a secondary fix. Uh, we don't get to the root of the problem. We simply just throw money at it and say, all right, we're going to open up new mental health facilities and uh, develop new programs. That's it. They don't do anything um, besides that. Um, okay, I'm not going to read all of these out, so I'll just kind of, I'm just going by the ones at the top here where the most amount of money was, um, uh, was offered. So that was uh, Liberals. Let's go to Labor now and Health. So $160 million to purchase land in Newtown where the Tasmanian private hospital was initially proposed and build a new public hospital by 2027. So yeah, um, $160 million in a new hospital. Um, I don't believe the Liberals had a commitment to, to um, building a new hospital. And health, uh, much like education, is generally one of those issues where the voters rate Labor better. They associate Labor with yeah. better funding for hospitals, but also just building them in the first place. And I guess that sort of is borne out here in these policies. Uh, $8 million per year to employ more nurses, social workers, and psychologists. So as I said, there's shortages of all those professionals. Uh, $2.5 million per year to expand the mental health emergency response service statewide to include a permanent presence, presence on Northwest Coast and Longceston. So there you go. That's, um, well, critical response services I guess that's people who are threatening suicide and that kind of thing, which unfortunately we know the rates are 
just continue to go up all the time. Uh, provide free mental health checks for teenagers at 32 community health centres. Uh, reemploy eight psychiatric emergency nurse positions within our hospital emergency departments. Um, and invest $5 million a year for four years to establish a small, dedicated community day program and residential stay services for families dealing with um, perinatal exhaustion, feeding, and settling issues and postnatal depression or anxiety. That is mental health related as well, obviously. Yes. So, yeah, we can see um, they sort of had like a, a bigger range of smaller programs compared to the Liberals wanting to just build that new facility. Um, now, I don't know if I should uh, always go to the Greens. What's that? <laughs> I was going to say, like, it, it's really just basic. We look at it like pondering, uh, pandering to the average age range of the base of each party in, in Tasmania. Yeah. Um, now, look, um, I'll go through the Greens here. The ABC has the Greens policies listed under each of these um, uh, major issues for the election. They really should have put the Jackie Lammy network too because um, the, the Greens, as I said before, um, have won four seats. But at the moment, Jackie Lambie Network is projected to win three. So, you know, they're basically the other uh, force in terms of minor parties in, in Tasmania. Anyway, uh, let's go through the utopian policies that the Greens have, mm. on, which is always what I think whenever I see, you know, their platform. It's like, how the hell could you actually do this? How could you afford it? How is it practical? Anyway... Uh, it's like that one scene from Quantum Leap when he like he says, "Am I retarded?" And he goes and looks in the mirror. He's got fucking Down syndrome. <laughs> yeah, and um, I mean, I, and I, I dare I say that the Greens know themselves that these uh, policies are so outlandish that um, you know, it's just well, they know they're never going to get into power, so they might as well just promise them anyway. You know. Yeah, and then the closer and, and, and closer. That's kind of <laughs> the more realistic they would have to actually be with the policies they're selling to the <laughs> public. And also that's kind of fucking sad considering that's their home state. Yeah, it is. Um, yeah, the, the Australian Greens really were born out of Tasmania when it came to the, um, the protesting um, against like dams and uh, old growth forest logging, that kind of stuff. Certainly where uh, the future leader, Bob Brown, cut his teeth getting arrested multiple times. Um, yep. And, you know, at least you could say, even though I still don't like that um, uh, incarnation of the, the Green Party, it's a lot more respectable than what it has morphed into today. Um, you know, it was started by a bunch of, like, hippies, many of whom were, like, older and who genuinely lived in rural areas, who lived out near the forest and everything. Uh, you can't say the same thing about the, the very urbanised city-dwelling uh, Melbourne Greens of today, you know, which is where their uh, power base... Urbanised, latent, homo <laughs> Urban either latent or open homosexuals. Yeah, well, um, or remember Bob Brown is homosexual himself as well. Yes. So that's a that comment <laughs> has not, that has not really changed, actually. But it is certainly... Just yeah, the urbanised part. Organized. Yes. Um, okay, so they've promised an extra 40 nurses and midwives, um, 87 full-time paramedics by June 2025, recruit 30 new ambulance staff per year for five years, recruit 25 clinical educators and 50 coaches by 2030, um, 120 new nurses per year until 2030, fund 10 new positions for psychiatric emergency nurses. So there we go, more mental health stuff being thrown into the mix there. Um, establish alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs unit. Uh, new public withdrawal management and rehabilitation beds. All right, what they're talking about here is where, you know, you basically have a safe space to go and use your drugs. Do those things, yeah. yeah. And then you... At the same I don't know time, why they like this, this policy. It's like, oh, harm reduction. And like, basically it's like, can't you fucking, like, look at the writing on the wall of the fucking other places that did this shit? 
Right. So this goes hand in hand with policies like uh, pill testing as well, which um, I saw they're, they're, they're rolling out in Queensland as well. Uh, a support for this program really in each, uh, originated with the Greens. Labor sort mm. of took it on later on. Um, because as we know, Labor just, it was certainly in terms of social issues, um, you know, just give them a couple of years and they'll support what it, whatever it is that the Greens are supporting eventually. Um, so, oh, well, yeah, there it is right there, pill testing at events and festivals. So, yeah, they've got this certainly as a, um, a policy in Tasmania as well. But yeah, again, pill, we've covered pill tests before. It's like one of the things that we we, do, we don't want to be in the situation where we have to fucking support it. But unfortunately, like, you know, festival goers are a bunch of fucking degenerates, help them or not. Right. Well, look, that's why I say um, let's have a compromise and let's do drug bins, like drug bins that offer amnesty. That means yeah. that when you, go, when you go to the whatever festival it is, before you pass through the line where you – um, show your ticket and get stamped and all of that, you've got like a halfway point where if you've got any drugs on you, you can just throw them into the bin and you will not be arrested. You will not be charged for that. It's just a point where like if you want to get rid of them, get rid of them. After that point, if you bring them through, there will be sniffer dogs and everything and you'll be busted at that point. Um and I can't believe, like, they, they did this for a little while in Australia. There was actually a few um, festivals where they did this, and it was actually really successful. Like, the police said that they got more drugs out of those bins than they ever typically got from searching people. So it was actually really successful. And nowadays, people have just forgotten about it. It's just, like, yeah, people haven't even really heard of the idea. Um, so yeah, I don't know why, why that was just forgotten about when it was actually working, but anyway, um, all right, we'll move on to education. Now, before I go through the policies here, uh, I have to point out that one of the, uh, issues people were really talking about in this election was mm -hmm. how fewer people are passing year 12. Now, um, in the next races war, I know I've got a story in the prep about the escalating level of violence in schools. Um, so I have no doubt that that would be happening in Tasmania as well. Uh, teachers have actually been talking about, I'm not joking, students who turn up to school with spy cams attached to their person. And the reason why is because of school bullies uh, assaulting them and otherwise. And the parents are getting so sick of what's going on and they're sick of the lack of uh, ability in the school to combat the problem that they're getting their kids to wear spy cams so that they'll have video evidence of the, the kind of abuse and everything that they're suffering at the school. Such so, fucking damn it. Yeah. And uh, a lot of the, like, the teachers were saying that, you know, they feel really uncomfortable in the classroom as well because they know that several of these students are, like, basically filming them, you know, <laughs> stuff is going on. Um, so when you've got shit like that happening, when you've got people preoccupied with their own physical safety and walking around with spy cams attached to them, that's going to be a little... What the fuck is going on? <laughs> Just letting Satan out of the room there. Yeah. She's been remarkably quiet. Uh, Real's, Real's really well behaved this episode. Yeah. So, look, again, just like I was saying before in terms of secondary um, solutions here, again, what I'm going to just read out here from the Libs, Labor, and Greens is just um, more money, more programs, uh, more places in TAFE and uni and that kind of thing. But they're not getting to. Uh, all these other issues that are stemming in the classroom that are preventing students from from learning. And, you know, I think Tasmania kind of escapes, uh, you know, the, the multicultural fate that, you know, we have on the mainland, especially in the capital cities. Uh, in other words, Tasmania still looks pretty white. Um, but yeah. they're not escaping from it entirely, you know. No, uh, just a different timeline, different schedule. Yeah. 
it might just be happening. They might, you know, be sort of just catching up to say where we are in Sydney, Melbourne, Perth, etc. Uh, but they're getting there. They are getting there. And, and again, I have no doubt that uh, the increasing rates of uh, students to uh, failing to pass year 12 would absolutely have something to do with that. Uh, in other words, they've just got stupider students who are being enrolled from the third world. And what a surprise, they find it harder to pass their exams. No surprise there. All right, so... Um, so, and what the... Uh, go for what the Liberals want here. So $25 million upgrade to the Dodgers Ferry Primary School, $800,000 to expand the Youth Build Program to all secondary schools, $30 million um, VET facilities fund to up upgrade equipment in schools, colleges and trade training centres, $5 million in early years workforce development fund to upskill the early childhood education workforce through scholarships and relocation incentives, and $32 million uh, to build four new child and family learning centres. Uh, okay, so as you can see, some of these things aren't really particularly education related. It's to do with um, childcare. <laughs> it's like, uh, let's uh, create these glorified babysitters. What is the median age of Tasmania? I don't know. It'd be older than everyone else, though, wouldn't it? Yeah, because, like, again, for new listeners, Tasmania is functionally our old folks' home. Well, it, it's very popular for people to retire in, like, partly, you know, because it's 42 sort years. Of it's our quietest state, very picturesque and everything. Uh, it's, you know, cl uh, the climate is a lot kind of milder. It's cooler over there. People yeah, it's, it's on a trend for there. aging. So I don't know why there's a focus on that kind of spending. Is there something planned on the horizon? I'm not sure. But I do know that Tasmania, like, sucks in more tax dollars than anyone else. And... They receive they receive a dis disproportionate amount of GST revenue as well, most of which they get from us here in WA, thanks to our mining sector. Um, anyway, still on education, let's go to labour. Um, they want to establish a centre of excellence for automotive hydrogen and electric vehicles at the Clarence TAFE campus in War. Okay, so this is definitely not a surprising one. Um, I think we mentioned um, in the last races war that there is a national shortage of electric vehicle technicians, which you can basically imagine as electric vehicle mechanics, even though they're completely different trades. You know, um, there is a shortage of them. And in fact, around about 50% of the positions advertised for electric vehicle technicians, around uh, about 50% uh, are not being answered. And, you know, that's no surprise um, in that, in that the government is just pushing, pushing artificially to insert electric vehicles into the car market. And they're just not allowing enough time for the rest of the economy to adapt. And that includes things like actually producing workers that know how to fix these vehicles. All right. Um, and that is a major headache. So now, like, Labor have kind of caught on to that. And they're like, all right. Um, all this uh, subsidization of electric vehicles um, has to translate into uh, broader aspects of the economy, not just the electric vehicles, but, you know, the people who work with them, who fix them as well. So that's what they're trying to do here. They want to make this a very attractive trade. They want it to be like a cool thing to be an EV technician. <laughs> I don't know how um, successful they're going to be in that, but nonetheless, that's what they want to do. Um, okay, increase allowances paid to apprentices when they have to travel for study, um, create new apprentice tool allowance to provide up to $500 rebate for apprentices to purchase relevant tools or safety equipment. Um, yeah, and it kind of goes on there. Like most of these uh, reforms are very much to do with TAFE, technical colleges and apprenticeships. So ordinarily, I'd say that's good. Uh, you know, let's stop getting so many people going to uni and get them um, a technical education instead. That's a good thing. 
my problem is like, okay, where exactly, what sectors of the economy is Labor looking to um, establish these trades? Uh, in all the gay areas, I would argue. Oh, and also, okay. like, um, you know, if you continue up that policy for an extended period of time, one, you're going to have people with actually completely useless trade degrees. Just because I'm, and I'm, I'm going to put my foot down. I don't think electric vehicles are going to migrate outside of the ownership of the upper, upper middle to upper middle class. Um, I don't think they just materially have the ability to, to migrate from there. And two, I think it's probably a bad idea because, say, if you actually get people in to do this kind of stuff, you're going to be looking at like a a country Google type situation where you're now importing your elite class from outside because you're just not manufacturing them internally. Right, okay. And, and you don't even think long term that this is something that will, you know, in, in terms of the laws of trickle-down economics where they say the the luxury of today is the necessity of tomorrow, I mean, surely there was a time where people said, oh, yeah, the, a poor person will still not be able to get a car. Um, people said about computers even. I forget where the quote came from, but um, there was. I remember there, there was this industrialist who predicted that uh, – computers would only get bigger and more expensive and that only like a few hundred people would ever own them. And, you know, I would say that those, those arguments were false because, you know, like what is the material that makes up a computer and how abundant is that? And maybe the, the understanding, like, you know, like boiling down silicon bullion or wafering out into chips and et cetera, you know, like maybe that was like very costly and very expensive and very limited at the time. But we're not running out of fucking silicon. We're not running out of, like, you know, steel for, for cars or aluminium for their bodies and frames. What we all run out of very fucking quickly is both rare earth and um, alkaline metals um, that are used in the construction of the physics-limited components of electric cars. Okay. I can maybe see that for fucking... As well? Yeah, lithium... Uh, cobalt, coltan, etc. Okay. Well, that's the only reason green, why I would even make that statement. The greens on on education. No, oh, I love these. Free Tasmanian TAFE. Abolish public school levies. Employ one hundred and ninety five new teachers. Help to recruit 800 staff in areas of school shortage with $5,000 per year towards hex debt. Count university study towards long service leave. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, fucking um, Christ. Hire, hire 50 school psychologists, 40 social workers, 70 speech pathologists, 30 education support specialists. Well, you know, it probably would be better to uh, – would be good to get – um, much bigger numbers in uh, school psychologists, but where the hell are you going to get them? Um, as I said before, we've got too many people studying psychology, but we have very, very, um, we have a huge shortage of people actually getting a clinical qualification in psychology, actually getting the training where you become a clinical psychologist and you become a counselor. Uh, you know, even if you could afford that, you're not going to find the people who have those qualifications. Um, provide 30 hours of free tutoring for students who fall behind national standards. Funding for breakfast programs in all public schools. $110 back-to-school supplies grant for schools for uh, children be uh, below the poverty line. Extend a smart food and move well, eat well program to all public schools. Really? Uh, the Greens support the um, move well, eat well. I thought that would be, uh, you know, kind of considered body shaming. Anyway, uh, fully mm. fund Aboriginal education services, reform the University of Tasmania Act, establish up to 20 new TAFE courses specialising in installation and maintenance of renewable energy and infrastructure, fund 500 scholarships up for people specialising in the field of renewable energy infrastructure. So again, you know, um, all of these issues, they have to sort of politicise it with their own particular brand. 
you know, it's not just that they want uh, reform in education. They wanted specifically to uh, provide support to the green energy economy, both Labor and the Greens, and to only a slightly lesser extent the Liberals are in on all of that. Give, give them a couple of years, they'll be on board. Okay, now... We're not, as I said, we're not going to go through every single one of these issues. We'll be here all bloody day if we did. But uh, one of the ones I want to go through that I, I said was not listed as one of the major issues is law and order. And I want to do that because I want everyone to be talking about law and order and the general breakdown uh, across the country because of rising immigration rates. Uh, and not just because of that, but policy failures where we continue to basically just blame police and prison guards and youth custodial officers for apparently uh, contributing to the cycle of crime uh, rather than breaking it. Do we have institutional problems? Yeah, we do have fucking institutional problems, but also we've got fucking people problems. We've got fucking problems with the fucking biomass of this fucking country. Well, look, one of the issues that uh, enjoys bipartisan support, is closing the Ashley Youth Detention Centre. So that is the only jail in Tasmania that they have for youth offenders. Both Labor and the Liberals want that closed down. Now, the Liberals actually said that it would be closed down before the end of 2024. They have since had to walk that back because, well, you can't just close it, all right? Both parties, even though they haven't announced this, they know that if they're going to close it, they need to have rebuilt another institution. You cannot shut down the only youth prison in your entire state and and not have another one. It is just not feasible. How the hell could you do that? So reality has caught up and they they said, no, it will remain open for this year. Even Labor was saying that a Labor government would would not close it in 2024. But at the same time, they're not announcing anything else, really. They're not saying um, what a new facility would look like or even um, the plans on when and where to build the new facility. Um, But anyway, I mention that just because uh, they both seem to uh, want to show that they are opposed to the kind of practices that that goes on in the Ashley Youth Detention Centre. And... That's more actually to do with... The what, man. animal control? Yeah, well, look, I got, I'll point out here, I'm mainly talking about white white kids. Yeah. Uh, because there's no such thing as a full-blooded Aboriginal in Tasmania. And the the ones who do have Aboriginal blood, even though they tend to be like octoroons or so, they're like very, very watered down, let's say. Uh so I'm not even, uh, believe it or not, including the, the racial question all that much when it comes to law and order in Tasmania. I certainly would be in other, other states. Uh, but in Tasmania, it's simply a failure of policy. So I'll go through um, some of these, uh, some of the policies that they have announced anyway. Presumptive sentencing for assault on frontline retail and hospitality workers. Okay, that's actually a, a bit more of a tough on crime approach there. Uh, presumptive sentencing, meaning that there is a presumption that you will actually get a particular sentence for assaulting, say, um, people at the shops. Because yes, there has been an increase in that happening. People assaulting retail and hospitality workers. It's incredible when you think about it, like why you would actually want to go and do that. Um, Recruit 60 more police, deploy a permanent strike force to target serial criminals, deliver a relief pool for frontline workers to ensure safe staffing is maintained at 24-hour stations, introduce stronger penalties for hooning, road rage, and vehicle theft. Um, By the way, that included uh, harsher penalties for crimfluences, that is someone who videos their crime and then uploads it online as a way of promoting it. 
and also daring other people to go and do the same or do even better. Or, you know, that's the way they put it. Do better than me. Yeah, like break my record. See if you can steal more cars than I did tonight. Um, introduce a new law that looks at uh, that makes boasting and posting about crime. Oh, there you go. Uh, an aggravating, yeah, that's it. So an aggravating factor in sentencing. So in other words, your sentencing will be more if you're also shown to be a crim fluencer. Um, new sex offender disclosure schemes deliver ongoing funding for. Um, three art centers supporting victim survivors of family and sexual violence. Uh, I'll just read one more. Build a new purpose-built uh, Kingston Emergency Service Hub, a Winyard emergency, emergency Services Hub, and a new Rosebury Emergency Services Hub. Okay, let's move over to labor. Uh, $3.7 million over three years for the um, JCP Youth Support Program for Young People. So this is, uh, you know, a diversionary program. Let's keep them out of jail and let's, uh, you know, get them into other community programs instead. Yearly funding of $1.5 million for dedicated police task force to target repeat offenders. An initial half a million dollars to investigate the establishment of a standalone youth court. And, uh, well, yeah, close Ashley Youth Detention Center as soon as possible. <laughs> Um, oh, well, it says here that the Liberals' timeline is now mid-2026. But, yeah, like I said, it was originally supposed to be this year. But, yeah, how are you going to do that when another one doesn't exist? All right, get ready for the Greens here. Decriminalize personal drug use. Establish a specialist oh, yeah. alcohol court. Remove the participant cap in court-mandated diversion. Establish a bail hostel in Hobart. <laughs> that would be that'd be an interesting hostel. Uh, increase legal aid and community legal centre funding. Compensation scheme for people who have convictions expunged. Actually, that one is not so. That's bad. not too bad. Yeah, um, that, I mean that's a real problem for a lot of people. If you've been um, uh, wrongfully convicted, yeah, you should be um, up for compensation. I agree with that. Uh, Means-based fines based on a person's income? No, I don't agree with that at all. Um, this is the idea that, like, say, if you get a speeding fine, um, you shouldn't have to pay a bigger fine as a, a rich guy who got it. Um, and my basic argument for, like, why is because, well, the tax system is supposed to kind of even the playing field. Um, and you don't want to provide extra incentives for people you know, to go out and do speeding and, and whatever else. I've, I've never agreed with that that particular policy from the Greens. They've supported that for decades, by the way. Um, raising the age of criminal responsibility to 14. Hell no. Okay. Um, even though they say wouldn't have as big a problem with, uh, you know, the very young offending in Tasmania as, say, we would here in WA or the Northern Territory, 14 is way too old. Okay, there's plenty of um, juveniles under 14, some of whom com commit horrendous acts. And the idea that you can just let them off scot-free, no way. No, no way I would, I would support that. Um, introduce targeted violence. Oh, hate crime legislation. That's what that means. Okay. Um, don't think I need to uh, express my opposition to that, obviously. I think that would be a ridiculous thing to do. Mm. Uh, strategy to increase use and effectiveness of police youth diversion programs. So, yeah, they just want to go a little bit further than Labor to. Sounds like your typical programming. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about climate and the environment. Um, the Liberals actually want to expand uh, forestry logging in Tasmania. Now, we know that that's a huge driver of the economy there. Um, the CFMEU, Construction, Forestry, Mining and Energy Union, uh, Tasmania is like the only state where uh, forestry is really, really represented through the CFMEU. Everywhere else, they're basically just for construction and mining. You know, that's, that's what they do. 
But in Tasmania, no, it's 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 different. It's actually forestry, and makes sense. Arguably, arguably, Mark Latham, when he was leader of the Labor Party, he lost a lot of support back in two thousand and four, where he reached an agreement with Bob Brown of the Greens to preserve much of um, Tasmania's forestry. That uh, was staunchly uh, opposed by the CFMEU. Uh, and in fact, Howard went out there, gave a speech, and ended up shaking the hands of many forestry workers. So Mark Latham saw that, because I read of the later Latham Diaries, and he said in that that he saw that as like a big betrayal of the CFMEU, of its members who were supposed to be supporting Labor. And I just have to think, well, hold on. Didn't you betray them? They thought you had their back there in, in terms of preserving their jobs and their way of life in Tasmania. And you went and did this deal with the Greens. So um, Labor have actually traditionally been uh, more pro-forestry in Tasmania than they have on the mainland, simply because it is such a driver. Um, it's it's so uh, key to the lives of so many working class people in Tasmania uh, that, you know, to turn your back on it is to turn your back on the working class, to turn your back on the traditional constituents of labor. Um, so you are still finding, though, that uh, Labor are less keen on opening up uh, logging rights on more forestry in Tasmania. And it does tend to be the Liberal Party that support that a bit more. Therefore, you can only assume that they have taken a little bit of the working class vote from Labor. Um, as to whether or not that had a big factor in this election, probably not. It wasn't really talked about all that often. Um, anyway, so talking about climate and energy specifically, or more, sorry, more generally, I should say, um, the Liberals won $8 million over four years to establish a Tasmanian Threatened Species Fund. Uh, Labor won half a million dollar workforce package for national parks, um, banned single-use plastic. Oh, my God. Um, you know, like, you can't even get plastic containers, plastic spoons, of course, plastic straws went out a long time ago, um, and they usually dissolve on you when you're only halfway through your drink. So I want to punch a hippie every time I'm left with a product like that. Um, also, that one thought, fucking comedian was like, every time I have to use a fucking pla uh, a paper straw, the liberal in me dies a little bit. Oh, most people hate them. Oh, yeah. I certainly do. But the problem is, I'm not seeing enough of a backlash to reverse that trend. If anything, it just keeps coming uh, more intense. Like I said, even the like the cap that they put on your drink at fast food places, even that is like made of paper now. You can't yeah. even get the cap on your drink made out of plastic. Oh, no, the, the, again, it was just this fucking switch over. The uh, production houses that you know had them manufactured and distributed just changed over. Right. That's good. And so here, this is Labor saying ban single-use plastics, like just all of it, full stop. Um, now, thankfully, that's not in the Liberal Party's platform. So, yeah, we, we won't have an outright ban. But, of course, like the rest of the country, they will follow in the same trend. Okay, so the Greens, they want to end native forest logging completely in Tasmania. But I guess, according to them, no jobs on a dead planet, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they want a standalone Department of Environment and Water, statewide ban on single-use plastics. There we go. Target of 10% of Tasmanian waters to be no-take reserves. A ban on all new fossil fuel projects. Reviewed state-based environmental laws introduce sectoral emissions targets. Formally reverse $356,000 uh, thousand hectares of forest. Uh, so not only do they want to ban it completely, they want to um, bring back 
a lot of what was already lost. Uh, laws to confine cats to the owner's property. I guess that's not a bad one right there. They're little murder can. machines. They are murder machines, yeah. And um, particularly when it comes to birds, that's the, the main problem, um, the killing of native Australian birds. Um, introduce a new national park tenure that allows for Aboriginal ownership and management. Where are the Aborigines in Tasmania, though? Wait, <laughs> have a look at them. Uh, they really, they never look Aboriginal. Even the ones that genuinely do have a little bit of Aboriginal blood in them, they never look Aboriginal. It's, it's the fucking drop in the wine basket, not wine barrel. <laughs> the one drop rule, yeah. Um, okay. Well, I think we've, yes, we have. We've gone through all of the major issues. There's more, of course, but we're not going to go through every single one of them. Um, now, there was another story I did want to get to, which was on, oh, man, why have I not organized this better? Oh, this is it. So the things that uh, Labor and the Liberals agree on. Uh, I thought this was interesting because it, goes to show the illusion of choice. Now, even though, of course, there were some differences as we just went through, um, there's a hell of a lot of things where nothing was going to change, no matter what, no matter who won, uh, you know, things were going to stay exactly the same. So let's go through a few of them. Um, antique firearms. This was an interesting one. So back in February, the Libs announced that uh, uh, Tasmanian police uh, made that uh, antique guns made before 1900 would no longer be exempt from licensing, registration, and storage requirements. So in other words, you had to register and get a license for a gun that was made before 1900. And uh, dare I say that that gun would have no chance of actually firing, Okay. It's called an antique firearm for New. a reason. It's not there for it's, it's hunting. A, God save you if it, if you do try and fire that thing. It, yeah, don't don't attempt to either. But obviously, these are antique firearms because they're antiques. They're not supposed to be operated in any way. They're simply just there as a collector's item uh, for show. <laughs> That's all it is. So uh, the idea that you should have to register that as like a you know. A licensed firearm is a bit of a joke. So they both said they're going to wind back uh, those laws. I uh, already went through this one, the closure of Ashley Youth Detention Centre. Yeah, as we know, closing it in this year was just completely untenable. So uh, mid-2026 is the date that the Liberals want it closed now. And Labor have said that they simply want it closed before then, but they haven't given a date. And as I said, nor have they given a date for the establishment of a new detention centre which you obviously need. Um, okay, now this is an interesting one because this one uh, was bound to prove false. And that is that both Labor and the Liberals said that they were not going to do deals with the minor parties or the independents. Well, how on earth can you avoid that when neither party is going to form a majority? You just can't do that. Um, the whole idea of forming a coalition when you're in minority government is to do deals with independents, with minor parties, so that you secure their support for you to perform government. There's no other way about it. So <laughs> that was an interesting one, um, especially given that the polls in the lead up to the election, um, granted it was only about a one month um, election cycle because it was called early, uh, but nonetheless, they always showed that a hung parliament was predicted so for both parties to announce that they were doing no deals, I thought was pretty silly of them. Anyway. Um, oh, electricity. So this is where the policies still differ, actually. Um, I mean, both parties, uh, they're similar in terms of they're promising to bring down electricity prices in Tasmania, but the policies do differ. So Labor has promised to cap uh, to cap power prices at 2.5% for the next three years. Hmm. No, I don't see how they could, um, I mean, they could do that, I guess. 
Uh, the power companies are certainly not going to like that, though. No, but it would be it would be within their power to do that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but it would severely uh, hurt the profit margins of the power companies. Um, and that, they reckon, is going to save the average Tasmanian 400 bucks a year in power prices. Uh, the Libs are promised a $250 energy bill credit for every Tasmanian household by June 30 and a $300 dividend for small businesses. Um, both parties want to rewrite state-owned energy generator Hydro Tasmania's charter so that it puts Tasmanian households and customers first. Okay, what practical uh, good would actually come out of that, though? Probably not much. Uh, environment, we already kind of done that. Um, gambling pre-commitment. So, yeah, apparently, like, uh, pokies are... a uh, like more of a problem in Tasmania than other places. Well, uh, who shows up to fucking pokies and what's the demographics of Tasmania? Yeah, well, as we said before, yeah. you know, their, their population tends to be a little older over there. Uh, yeah, and um, old people are the ones who tend to play the pokies, basically. Well, it's pretty diverse, but wow, it's, it always amazes me just like how many like pensioners you see glued to the, the pokies screens. Um, so, the Liberals announced a card-based pre-commitment scheme to tackle the problem, um, and Labor said that they support that. So, there you go. You, you have actually seen the Liberal Party slowly break loose from the grip of the gambling lobby, actually, um, particularly in Tasmania, actually, because I remember covering this before. Uh, the gambling lobby were big donors to the Liberal Party. And uh, this, I think it was this uh, this particular policy, actually, on the pre-commitment scheme. Uh, they had basically been promising the gambling lobby, lobby that they would not introduce this or uh, things like, uh, you know, cards that lock you out of the system after you've lost a certain amount. And they went back on that, which is good. So it means that they're not just listening to the donors anymore. So if I can give a rare bit of praise to the Liberal Party, I guess I'd give it to them, to them in that respect. Um, housing. How the hell have we not discussed housing yet? Um, so Labor said, they call this their game changer policy. Um, this would uh, enable eligible people to buy a house without a deposit. Uh, and that would mean that the government would pay the deposit for you. So we've all heard of various schemes like this. You know, they all yeah. operate roughly on the same premise that the government... You don't own the fucking house. Up. Yeah, yeah. And there's all different ways, you know, the, the detail always differs. In, in this respect, but basically the, the government becomes like a part owner in the house with you to, you know, move you along to actually take out a loan and uh, at least have your name written down as being a part owner in that property. Um, so the Liberals have a very similar scheme uh, that's based on shared equity as well. And, yeah, I mean, in terms of uh, the cost of living debate in in Tasmania, uh, no surprise that housing was the one that came up the most as a specific issue. So uh, I don't think, like in terms of vacancy rates and rent prices and house prices going up, I don't think things are quite as bad as, say, Melbourne and Sydney. In terms I saw of a pack of homeless descend on someone today. That was that's like the first time I've ever actually have seen that kind of behaviour. Well, remember in WA, even though our rent and house prices like don't uh, can't compete with Melbourne and Sydney, we have the lowest rate of house vacancies. In fact, in some suburbs of Perth, house vacancies are as low as 03 percent, which is effectively zero. So, like, there's basically suburbs in Perth where there are literally no houses free at all. That's how bad it's gotten. And, yeah. Uh, oh, that's right. By the way, why are, 
this is not uh, written down in this article, but I do remember that one of the policies for the Greens in this election, in this Tasmanian election, was a tax on vacant houses. What good would that do? There are none, you know. Um, like maybe if you crack down on people like just using them as Airbnb because, you know, they they rent them out as a Airbnb for, say, a few days a year and then that house is listed as non-vacant even though for most of the year it is vacant. If you want to crack down on that, maybe that would have a bit of a difference. But in terms of the houses that are officially on paper vacant, there are so little of them that putting an extra tax on them would mean barely anything for revenue Nothing. raising and barely anything in terms of actually freeing up supply in the housing sector. You, you, you're you're trying to befuddle and statecraft a piece of material that isn't there to begin with. That's right. So if, if there was um, a high rate of vacancy, sure, <laughs> it might be a good policy, but, but there just isn't. So it's a tiny, tiny amount. Um, political donations. So basically, um, both parties have not, uh, did not announce any more um, reform in this regard. Now, Tasmania is actually kind of behind the entire country when it comes to um, political donation reform, because most states say that, okay, um, once you go over a certain amount uh, for a donation, like say over $5,000, you've got to declare your identity. You must be publicly identified as uh, the person or the entity that made that donation. Now, uh, in Tasmania, they don't have any specific laws about that. So what happens is it defaults to the federal threshold of $16,300. However, in other states, it's usually around $5,000. If you donate $5,000 or more, you must say who you are. I've got to say I'm not really that phased um, in terms of, of that. Um, I guess uh, in terms of showing Jewish individuals, that would be interesting. I don't think there's a hell of a lot of um, Jewish influence in Tasmania, though. So I'll leave uh, it. Basically, there's only one big hub for it, and that's the White Rose Society with uh, Kasseros. Right. Yeah, but that's, that's Tasmanian University. That's a very select location. Yep. Um, okay, so public transport. Both Liberal and Labor promised to halve um, public transport fares. And uh, I believe that the Liberals actually wanted it in certain parts of Tasmania to just be free altogether. Um, that's that one part of like uh, middle-class welfare wouldn't be the, the right term, but uh, they like appealing to pensioners, the Liberal Party do, a lot of the time. So they'll be more generous with the freebies to older people uh, when it comes to things like public transport than they will with... Um, other age demographics of uh, in the economy, let's say. Um, oh, God, treaty and truth-telling. So um, back in July 2021... Not again. Uh, so this, there was a process for truth-telling and treaty that started back then. Um, spent about four months leading the consultation and presented a report that was called Pathway to Truth-Telling and Treaty, um, that was presented in November in 2021. So the government is apparently working with Aboriginal people on options for the next steps in implementing truth and treaty. Um, now, I've got to say here that let's say we did not have the referendum on the Indigenous Voice of Parliament. I would be likely to say, OK, considering this has bipartisan support, this is going to become a reality. But, it, but considering we did have that referendum and the no won overall, what, by 61%, I believe, was the final figure, roughly. Um, and then we end up getting pushback against, to, uh, against a broad range of Indigenous policies, such as welcome to country, acknowledgement of country, all that stuff. Um, and also the fact that, as I just mentioned, 
this process happened back in 2021, you know, some time before the referendum happened. I would suspect now that uh, the, the government really knows, the Liberal Party in Tasmania knows that this stuff is not popular because it was rejected so resoundingly in the referendum. And support for treaty and truth, uh, uh, sorry, treaty and truth in, say, Victoria by the Liberals and Queensland by the Liberals has effectively collapsed. You fucking so, evaporated. Yes. So I don't see any reason why that wouldn't translate into Tasmanian politics. So basically what I'm saying is this stuff may not ever happen in terms of moving forward with truth-telling and treaty processes. It might just uh, reach a standstill, and I hope it does. Okay. It should have died. We knew this was going to happen when they, when, the, when they fucking lost hard. And they said that the, the, the conceit they gave to their supporters was, well, we'll just like work it in the back end anyway. We'll just go state by state. Right. Um, okay. Let's have a look at some of the other issues here. Um, just last thing, in terms of the economy and the cost of living, uh, if you want to know, Tasmania is in debt, just like every other state in the country. And apparently, the latest Treasury forecast shows that uh, there will be four straight budget deficits and debt is going to rise to $6.1 billion. Um, economist Sol Eslake, <laughs> I have not researched this guy's background, but yeah, you might as well hmm. be called Woodman. Um, he was saying that, uh, yeah, he's also predicting debt and deficit to rise in Tasmania. Uh, Tasmanian government is sort of notorious for uh, being um, a higher spender. That's basically because they've got um, a larger demographic to spend on. And by that, I mean old people. They have the worst kind of, you know, aging population problem in Tasmania. Um, they, don't, also, they don't produce money. We fucking raked out their native industries. It's like, um, still remember that one documentary going to like capital cities in Australia. Yeah, it was done by like some like fucking like concert goers and like, oh, like what's a fun thing that you do in, in, in you know, this state and asking all the youth. And literally it was just a repeat of that one instance where the, that kid in Helsinki got asked the same thing, which is like drugs and alcohol and then suicide. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. We're being too mean to our Tasmanian friends here, I think. Um, no, but one thing about... The state is being to too mean. <laughs> Even though, like, debt and deficit did not, uh, was not, like, such a huge factor, you know, no one was really talking about it that much in this election. Still, when it came to costings for major economic plans in the state, um, those costings were only presented days before the election. And uh, this economist, Sol Eslake, um, said that was a bit contemptuous of the people. And I have to agree with it there. To release costings a few days out from an election, uh, both major parties doing that is, yeah, that is a bit contemptuous. You should definitely have your costings up well before then. Um, okay, just a couple of things. We're nearly finished, guys. This is a kind of a short episode um, for you. Uh, but... It is something that really caught my eye here, uh, and that is the Liberals have a plan to implement what they've called a stability clause. Uh, and this stability clause would actually kick out a member of parliament if they were elected as a member of the Liberal Party and then defected. So if they changed parties or if they no. became an independent now, as I mentioned at the very beginning of this episode, um, the kind of stability, instability that led to this early election was caused by two Liberal MPs who became independents. That really kind of, that threw them into minority government and threw them into a very uncertain state of affairs. 
So uh, they want to fix that. They want to make it so that an issue like that can't happen again. Uh, And it's actually got constitutional scholars debating on whether or not you could do it. If that can be done. Yeah. Yeah. So basically they're saying that uh, the Tasmanian constitution, because remember each state has their own constitution as well, does allow it. So at that level, there wouldn't be any issues. However, there is speculation that it would conflict with the federal constitution and thus be unconstitutional. So it could be brought to court and struck down. Nonetheless, uh, it appears that the Liberals still do um, want to go ahead with this. And i got to say, it's a very bizarre thing to do, um, like to actually just automatically have you kicked out of Parliament like that. Now, I'm not sure, but I would assume that if you were just kicked out of Parliament, if you were to do that, that would mean that that electorate then has to go to a by-election to elect a new member. And I suppose that that candidate who had just been kicked out could then run as an independent or uh, for whatever party they defected to. Um, But yeah, that's an interesting one to just say, all right, um, you've switched parties, you switched allegiances, you now have to leave and you have to fight for your position at a by-election. So I don't know if that is the most sensible option to have there, um, especially considering they're doing it very much out of self-interest, you know, to prevent um, a minority government of the future. And uh, right now it doesn't even matter because they're going to be a minority government. So... So, yeah. Um, so look, I should also make the point just to wrap it up here. Oh wait, no, we've got one other story. But before I get to that one, um, uh, it looks like because the fact you had so many uh, pre-polling votes, so many postal votes, round about one hundred thousand, it's estimated that we won't have uh, final figures and counts until roughly the eighth of April. So about another two weeks away so you know watch this space it would even be possible i've I've read this that it it is actually possible for labor to form government although by convention by westminster convention the party with the largest amounts of seats will be invited by the government to form a gov sorry will be invited by the governor to form government so as it stands right now the liberals have got 13 and Labor have got 10. So, um, Still close. Rebecca White, yeah, well, Rebecca White is the leader of the Labor Party. Um, she did effectively, um, even though she said that uh, the voters had voted to reject the Liberal Party, um, she did mm. later on effectively concede defeat by saying that, well, look, the Liberals are still going to win more seats than us. Therefore, they would be invited to form government and we wouldn't. But strictly speaking, there is that possibility that, say, the four Greens members could go with Labor. That would give them 14. With the seats still in doubt, you know, they might get one or two, so bring them up to 15 or 16. And then they could even um, secure the support of the Jackie Lambie network, which look like, looks like it could be about three. And that would bring them over the line, so they'd be able to form government. Um the Jackie Lambie party, it's very hard to say um, where exactly they are. Like, are they a left party? Are they a right party? Um, a lot they tend of things to fucking are- fluctuate. That might, that might not help them. There's, there's some fucking policies they take, which are like, okay, that's like, that sounds like your standard boomer con kind of like retard take. And there's some which are just progressive for better or for worse and conservative for better or for worse, to be honest. Um, but yeah, no, that's that might just fuck them up to be honest, because it's our fucking job to kind of figure these things out, and we don't even fucking know. Yeah, I mean, look, it's worth pointing out. As I said, Lambie comes originally from the Palmer United Party, and uh, they call them pups back then. And the the pups essentially were just like liberal light, you know. It was liberal party policies, and they were a little bit nicer to. Uh, refugees and a little bit more for climate action. That was really the only difference. 
it was like a slightly more left-leaning version of the Liberal Party. So that's where Jackie Lambie originally comes from. She's been good on things like veterans affairs, actually, in terms of getting veterans real, like, proper support once they leave um, the ADF. I think that's that's good. But, um, yeah, on other areas, she's been very questionable. Um, and people just didn't know for a long time where she stood on industrial relations reform. In the end, she basically went and supported Labor in the end. So you could argue that she was on the left. It's, it's, it's hard to say. And she had a gripe with the Tasmanian Liberals because uh, the Tasmanian Liberals actually ran an attack on her where they had a URL that was like lambynetwork.com, so obviously mimicking the name of the party. But when you follow that URL, it's an attack website made by the Liberal Party on her party, right? So um, they actually originally promised to take that down. They didn't. You can actually like go and search it yourself right now if you want to. It's still up. And now having a look at the fact that the Liberals are really going to be relying on the support of Jackie Lambie, they're probably thinking in hindsight that was a bad idea, actually creating a website that was dedicated to attacking the very party that mm. you should be kissing the ass of. So, yeah. Um, how, how, the, how, the, how the tide turns, how things change. <laughs> yes, very much. It's like um, a modern-day soap opera, but somehow actually more gay. All right, so we'll leave you just, guys with just one last story here. Uh, another kind of funny one that caught my eye. And uh, you, you probably, you may have seen um, Juice Media before. They've got a lot of sort of like um, political satire on YouTube. They have their videos are presented in the form of like... Uh, political ads. Well, yeah, like, like a political ad. Or a government uh, like, statement or some shit. Yeah, like one that would be put out either by a government or sort of like as a public service announcement or something like that. And like, honestly, you only have to watch them for about five seconds to know that it's comedy, that it's satire, <laughs> that it's not real, right? However, the Electoral Commission has said that the video um, looks likely like an advertisement and has, believe it or not, has warned of prison time and fines imposed on the people who are responsible for putting the ad out there. Well, well no, not an ad. Do, do, do that, that, that anyway ad. because I don't like them. <laughs> yeah, so look, one of the... this, By the way, they're, they're completely... Juice Media is completely left-leaning. All of their videos are out there basically as liberal attacks. Um, but one of the reasons that uh, Juice Media... Oh, sorry, the Electoral Commission is saying... Uh, that this looks like an ad advertisement for the Liberal Party is because Jeremy Rockliffe appears in it. I was like, really? So what did I want it to do? Was I'm just sharing the screen here. I just want people just to listen. I'm not it, the full um, video goes for like five minutes. So I'm just going to play like a minute here and uh, just see what you think. Like, uh, do you listen to this and think, oh yeah, that's a genuine Liberal Party ad? Land of wilderness and home to countless. Vanishing Wonders, Affordable Rents, Year 12 Completion, The Sweet Parrot, and of course, Liberal Governments. That's right. After being driven off the mainland for being utter bastards in every other state and territory, Tasmania is a refuge to the last Liberal Government in Australia, which is why here at the Tasmanian Government, we're very much in our ducks about the coming election. Hello, I'm from the Tasmanian Government. We've been running Tassie for the past 10 years, and as you'll discover on your visit, we've left no corner of this island un One in four Tasmanians live in poverty. Half of us can't read good. Tons are homeless, and our hospitals are so full, the sick have to wait in ambulances. And Yeah, so um, how could anyone possibly think that the Liberal Party would put out a political ad uh, loaded with F-bombs? and trashing their own uh, policy record for the past 10 years in Tasmania. Uh, uh, brain worms? 
Right. So the Electoral Commission actually came out and said that it was likely that many people would watch this and think that it was a genuine Liberal Party ad. So uh, Juice Media has responded to this by uh, blurring the Premier's face, blurring Jeremy Rockliffe's face in the video, and also, as you can tell, bleeping out all of the F-bombs that were included there. Um, the and, yeah, if, if, they, if they did not do that, they were, believe it or not, actually facing prison time for the release of that satire video. Can, can I just be a ghoulish hypocrite and just say that they should just go to fucking prison anyway, but not for this? Yeah, look, I mean, I'm not doing this to, like, defend Juice Media. Well, I guess I sort of am, but, I mean, this is obviously not a media outlet that I'm a fan of. No. Okay? <laughs> Complete obvious. Complete and obvious. You have, be, you have to be downright fucking retarded uh, to, to fucking look at that as, like, a legitimate political information piece. Right. But I am standing out, standing up for their right to put out genuine political satire to get across their own political point. I have no issue with that, and they should be able to use that as a valid medium to put the, the message out there, even if I think it's stupid or whatever. And I really think it's overreach for the Electoral Commission to come out and effectively say, we're going to send you to jail unless you would at least censor it. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's ridiculous. It's, it's... Oh, man. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, guys, nice little short hour and a half wrap-up episode for you for the 2024 Tasmanian election. Um, as I said, we're trying to get back into our new normal now that I've unpacked most of my boxes and set up most of my things in my new house. Uh, so we plan to do a show for you, as I said, on Tuesday. Should be out on Wednesday. Then we'll do one the Thursday after Easter. And then we'll hopefully go back to just doing every Thursday, week after week after then. Get back to new normal. So, yes. Thank you for supporting us. Thank you for listening. And we'll see you in a few days.